welcome to Changing the Table, where we hear stories that uncover the obstacles faced by new Europeans in politics. I'm your host, Sedan Anlar. As a journalist and once undocumented non-EU immigrant, I'm not just looking into how migrants can be empowered to take a seat at the decision-making table, but I'm also exploring how we can change the table itself. You might remember that in our last episode, we talked about voting rights and the challenges for migrants to exercise their electoral power. But at the very end of the episode, we concluded that voting is only one of the many ways of participating in politics. In this episode, we're going to pick up right where we left off and confront the pressing issues at the heart of democracy in Europe today. Low voter turnout, people's disenchantment with voting and mainstream politics, the rise of the far right. We're going to delve into the roots of this democracy crisis and explore how we can address it and make politics more responsive, inclusive, and innovative. We're going to look into how the political participation of migrants vary across different European countries, with a special focus on Ireland as a unique case study. How does Ireland's approach to political participation differ, and what lessons can be learned from its successes and shortcomings? To help me explore all these concepts and questions, I'm joined by two brilliant guests by Dr. Salome Mugua, CEO of Akidwa, an organization of migrant women in Ireland, and by Dr. Bashak Yavchan, head of research of the Migration Policy Group, who's working on a comparative index of national policies that encourage the civic and political participation of migrants, which is an expansion on the Migration Policy Group's flagship Migrant Integration Policy Index, also known as MIPEX. Join us as we reimagine democracy through greater participation, innovation, and creativity. Take a listen. Salome Bashak, welcome to the podcast. Thank you very much. Thank you. Great to be here. Salome, you've been actively involved in politics and community mobilizing in Ireland for decades. And I think it's safe to say that voter turnout has been declining in Ireland, like in many other European countries. The voter turnout at the national election in Ireland, the the latest one, was 62.9%, which is the fourth lowest ever in the country's history. Is this a signal of Ireland's democracy crisis? Could you give us a bit of a a sense of how electoral politics and participation is going in Ireland. Yeah, Ireland is actually an interesting, uh, you know, small country where one could think that we have the the democracy. But we see uh, that with the current situations, you know, we had the national elections, for example, in 2019. And out of the 160 members of parliament that were elected, only 36 of them, you know, were women and 124 were men. What happens in these situations is that everything ended up becoming very male-dominated, and we are also still talking about the patriarchy society. You know, from a migrant perspective, you know, our organization has taken a lead to encourage migrants, for example, to register to vote. We did manage, actually, to get a lot of people register for the elections, but when the day comes to go and vote, many people don't go to vote, and it's not only for migrants. It's the same, actually, with the other settled people, you know, indigenous Irish people who have been here for so long themselves. So it's not only migrants who do not vote. We also have a lot of huge population of Irish people who do not want to vote. And why don't people want to vote? Mainly because, you know, maybe they feel that the issues are not, uh, you know, attended to, the situations that they would like to see change are not changing. Especially, you know, we have a huge crisis here in Ireland on housing, and people keep on talking about housing, you know, year by, you know, during elections to another year and nothing that actually changes. So you're repeating the same issues. We have uh, now local elections actually next year. We'll be still talking about these issues that we spoke in 2019. So five years have come and gone very quickly and still the same issues remains. So which means even though people feel like there's that democratic process, it doesn't get to meet their need. But we would encourage people as much as possible 
to engage with the democratic process because we have the advantage here in Ireland. Even migrants who arrived um, two weeks ago or a few days ago, if they have a, an address here in Ireland, they can actually vote in local elections. And it's not in every European country that, you know, people get this, uh, you know, privilege. Yes, yes, absolutely. I mean, only 36 parliamentarians out of 160 members of the parliament, that, that's, that's not a very promising picture. But, but that's why I think, like you said, Ireland is, is a very interesting case study because on the one hand, you have a parliament with a huge gender disparity. On the other hand, the country has been seen as, as a pioneer for participatory political practices and spaces with its citizen assemblies, referendums, which led to historic decisions, right? Like the the referendum that repealed the abortion law or uh, the decision on marriage equality. Is this perception of Ireland, like this democratic utopia, any part of the reality? Um, you know, you have mentioned the changes that have occurred and happened in Ireland. Actually, if you look at very critically how those changes has happened, it's the push of the women. You know, you talk about uh, marriage equality, which was historic here in Ireland, you know, allowing that to happen. Also, when we talk about the reappeal, the amendment, you know, access to abortion and all, most of the things that has happened, actually, it's the women who are the forefront of it. But when you come to the democracy and where they are, for example, in the in levels of decision making or political participation, I explained it earlier. Out of the 160 members of parliament that we have in Ireland, only 36 are women, which is actually an increase, you know, and still very much dominated by men. So it's not a utopia. The democratic process, um, it depends on what you're fighting for, what you're looking at, issues that uh, uh, pertain to rights, especially women and the way they organize themselves. But when we uh, come to deciding on whom do we want to be on the table, and we are talking about how do we change the table, to be on that table of decision making and, 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 and making those decisions and you know, like signing off the policy and all that, it's the 124 men that the majority actually almost three times being over three times will end up being on that table making most of the decisions. So who holds then when we talk about them um, then who is in control of everything? It's mainly, and I spoke about the patriarchy, it's mainly the men. It's very male dominated. It goes back to parties. You know, parties, you know, sometimes you might even find some of the parties here. We have two of them who's, uh, you know, leaders are women. But it, it doesn't mean that, you know, the women are majority in those parties. So, for example, I'm just using gender for the sake of it. But when, again, we come to the issues of migration and race, you know, it, you, know you cannot even uh, compare because there's nothing to compare. We still don't have a member of parliament, for example, from the migrant community. So it goes back to the parties and how parties actually organize themselves and who do they allow into those parties. Absolutely. Salome, I think you made the lack of representation of politics in Ireland for women and migrants very clear. And yeah, the responsibility to fix that goes across all political bodies that are involved in, in these processes and parties, political parties are very much at the center of that, or at least they, they should be. Um, Bashak, I want to turn to you now because as a researcher you've been looking into the political situation and political participation in in Ireland as well you've been conducting comparative research to map out various participatory practices and national policies that encourage the civic and political participation of migrants i believe you have the first results on Sweden, um, the Netherlands, and Ireland, right? What kind of participatory practices have you been able to identify in Ireland? Yes, we try to understand these different policies embedded in the uh, in the historical and cultural context of different countries, which also, of course, uh, has an impact on the different opportunity structures available to the new Europeans and to migrants in the way that they can participate in politics. 
uh, but there are also changes within a country uh, sometimes and uh, over time. And uh, this is also something visible. For instance, in Netherlands, one of the uh, non-electoral uh, forms of participation, the consultative bodies, uh, was a very common form of participation at the national level. Uh, but we see over time a, a slow phasing out of uh, this model of participation. And now, while it is available at the local level, it is no longer uh, the preferred mode of political participation of uh, of migrants or any groups, as a matter of the fact. And uh, when we come to Ireland, there are um, a very um, big range of methods uh, for participation. But what sets Ireland really apart from all the other countries is how political integration of migrants is really a priority among the integration of migrants. And uh, we understand this from uh, a dimension uh, on this policy instrument that we built, the index that we built, uh, which is uh, whether or not the country has a strategy of integrating migrants. The strategy is not everything, but it is a, an important indicator of an intention, whether or not uh, there is a goal of uh, prioritizing this issue and setting clear goals and activities to ensure the goals. And uh, many countries that we have covered as part of the many EU countries that we've covered uh, do not have a very clear strategy and a clear strategy document. Why do I uh, emphasize this a lot? Because it all starts with a strategy and Ireland is really an important case, a good role model to all the other countries where it not only sets a very clear strategy, spelling out specifically what groups to include, in the political uh, participation, uh, targeting political participation, what specific areas of political participation is targeted, specific targets within these groups, uh, such as women, for instance. A as you can see also Salome's reflections, this is not to say Ireland is doing great on this and it's, you know, it needs a lot of improvement but it is an acknowledgement of where it needs to address. And that's why it's very important. It all starts with this. And uh, the strategy is also important because it sets a budget, right, for all the activities that come into this, uh, not just for the state to do, but also to support uh, the non-state actors, uh, migrant-led organizations in supporting their activities. And there is one other area where Ireland is doing great is setting a very clear agenda, um, a roadmap for monitoring migrant integration in general, including political participation. What does this mean? At the end of each year, all the state departments, the ministries come together and evaluate themselves against the benchmark and see, okay, this was our goal in the strategy. How much did we do? This is important because this way it's not just the lip service that they're doing by preparing an integration document, uh, strategy document, but also this shows that implementation is taken seriously. And then in this document, they also provide evidence. You know, they don't just say, yeah, we did great on this, but they also say, okay, we did this project on this, that project. So we see Ireland has been doing great in go out to vote campaigns. Uh, there have been many intercultural dialogue programs as well, also showing the host community the importance of integration of migrants. Um, so there has been uh, many activities that are listed every year under the integration document, monitoring documents, monitoring how well the country has been doing, which is uh, rather rare uh, when we compare it with other countries. So. As Saloma mentioned, there are uh, great things with Ireland in, when it comes to political participation of integration, but there are also a lot of areas that need room for improvement. But our impression is that Ireland is prioritizing these and making an effort in trying to understand where it lacks and what it needs to do to improve them. Okay, so far I understand that the situation in Ireland is... A mixed bag sure. with some good and some bad coexisting together. But I guess the most important part is that the strategy is there, which usually means that the next step is implementation and putting all of that into action. Let's zoom out a little bit to see how the 
other countries you have done research on compare. So that would be Sweden and, and the Netherlands. Do we see similar models there? What we've seen so far in our comparative analysis is that it actually countries that have been traditionally destinations for migrants that have some experience with diversity are already doing better. And countries that are higher on our you know, flagship indicator, MIPEX, are the ones that are doing better on political participation as well. And Sweden, even though it has a great integration framework in general, uh, that does not necessarily fully reflect on targeted policies on political participation of migrants. But what Sweden does great is a key component of political participation, which is naturalization. We have very high naturalization rates in Sweden, which makes it very easy, for instance, to vote for um, for migrants. So, yes, in Ireland, as Salome explained, e even the most recently arrived migrants can vote. In Sweden, you don't have that, but you have very high naturalization rates, which really allow for very good, extensive uh, integration into uh, the conventional mode of participation that is voting. Uh, as I said, in Netherlands, the uh, classical Dutch model of this uh, consultative bodies is slowly disappearing and uh, other forms are taking its place. Uh, but there is a general concern with the uh, mainstreaming of these policies and uh, of these practices into different policy areas. So uh, it is important to include migrants in uh, into policymaking uh directly relate to uh, migrants, but in Netherlands, we don't have all of the different policy areas being considered in this regard, and migrants are included in uh, policy making at uh, all different levels, uh, all, all different policy uh, areas as well. But still, these are countries that are doing a whole lot better, say, many of the Central and Eastern European countries, where the encounter with migrants is rather recent and uh, there are no institutionalized structures to accommodate them, be it in other areas of integration or political participation. Mm -hmm. So you're creating this comparative index, right, based on different indicators to see which countries have stronger or more inclusive participatory practices. But, but isn't it hard to compare something as abstract as political participation? I'm, I mean, I'm sure there is numerical data out there that makes it easier, but still, like, what would it mean for a participatory practice to be strong? So it's not easy to uh, measure an abstract concept as such, but we can measure the rights granted to them, and we can measure some policies that promote their representation participation. In doing this, we try to focus on different forms that participation can take place, like the conventional forms like electoral politics, but unconventional forms like all these collective actions and protests uh, and whatnot. And participation can also take place at different levels, right? We've talked about local politics, but there could be regional politics. And usually we talk about also national politics, national elections, but also decision making. But it doesn't stop there. We also have the supranational level. And here we're looking at the EU countries and European uh, elections are coming up, right? So they're a big part of this this political game as well. So it's important to understand the mechanisms that promote migrants' uh, participation in these uh, different levels of uh, elections and these levels, different levels of decision-making. It does not have to be just electoral policies. As a matter of the fact, Saloma has in, in indicated how voter turnout has been declining in Ireland, and it's not an isolated case. It's declining in many democracies around the world. And this can be because sometimes uh, citizens are uh, disenfranchised. Sometimes they think that there are no political parties representing them. Sometimes they resort to alternative modes of participation, though, right? In, in the U.S., there is more lobbying. In France, there is more protesting. And uh, so it's also important to take these uh, into consideration uh, when trying to uh, measure what uh, political uh, participation means. So uh, there is also the civic space that we need to 
take into consideration? What do the states do in creating, protecting, and fostering of a strong civic space? And civic education is also a dimension of it, how much of di diversity in the society is acknowledged and promoted in civic education. Do they think that, do people think that it's an important thing, you know, socially to go out to vote for all uh, segments of the population, all groups within the population? And also there is the rights dimension. So here we really prioritize the full political and civic rights through citizenship and what kind of obstacles there are against citizenship. Is it promoted? How is it promoted? Is uh, information for naturalization, import information about uh, voting in elections uh, made available to all migrant groups in different languages? And uh, are there any awareness raising campaigns? Are there any uh, there, is there a, a methodology for disseminating this information? Is data collected and uh, assessed on these regularly? So these are all different ways countries can encourage higher levels of political participation uh, of migrants and close the gaps, gap as we say it, because there's currently a very large participation gap between the uh, host communities or local populations that have been traditionally living there and more recently arrived uh, migrant communities that uh, became integral part parts of these societies. I totally agree. You know, here in Akidwa, we don't just talk to people to engage on politics because, you know, when you talk about politics, people are also coming from very different countries where politics is very, very different from the politics that we have here. Different in the manner that people fight during elections on who to put into power in some countries. There's chaos, you know, that happens before, you know, elections in most of the countries of where people have come from. I originally come from Kenya myself and I've witnessed a lot of, you know, harassment, physical harassment and what happens during elections. So, so many people would not identify or actually try even to engage as such because it's it's based on what they have seen before and that uh, has made them look at maybe politics differently. But if we actually try to position civic engagement as the starting point of everything and civic engagement as a democratic right for all of us, I think everybody can identify with it. The right to be able to participate at a you know, local level of where your children are going to school, engaging in community uh, work, engaging in anything that is happening in the community as a starting point before you go very high into talking about, uh, you know, entering into politics. Because entering into politics may look so huge. And it's true, you may need a lot of money to be able to prepare for a campaign. So if we could start everything with that civic education of educating people, what do we really mean by uh, democratic participation? And, and how important it is for us as a right and to be able to enhance that right, to be able to be involved in different levels of decision making, decision makings of um, things that matters to us as individuals, as families, as communities. Having that community engagement is so, so important. It's important for them to understand that, you know, we are not talking about uh, politics of very high level. We can start, you know, from the day-to-day -day decisions that are made about water that we drink or that we use, about the health centers, about uh, everything that in the society that happens because it's also involved us, it's also related to us. Uh, so mm -hmm. it's, it's very important. Mm -hmm. And having the, 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 the true information, because what you are seeing, for example, now mm -hmm. with the far right is that misinformation that has been created. So we have to come up with innovative ways of communicating as well. Mm -hmm. We've actually all mentioned the rise of the far right since the beginning of the episode. And Bashak, you just mentioned that some of these participatory practices are not institutionalized, which I think signals the precariousness of these participation models, considering how important they can be. I mean, sometimes these more non-conventional, non-electoral models of political participation are the only thing we can take part in. The only thing that allows us to be a part of the conversation, be a part of the table, and potentially and hopefully have a say in decisions that affect us. In the context of the rise of the far right, 
do you think these models might be at risk? How can we safeguard these practices and rights? I think this is a great question. And uh, I think we can also take a deeper look into Ireland to look for an answer to this question. As good of a case as Ireland is on many dimensions of integration, a lot of the uh, policies uh, that result in integration outcomes are not institutionally established. In other words, there is not necessarily always a law that determines, that guarantees these rights. It's more a practice and understanding, um, maybe sometimes um, communication at the uh, website of a department that grants certain rights. So it is not really ingrained in an institutional structure, which can pose a question, right, when there is a different political wind that comes from the far right. And uh, that means that the, these rights should not be taken for granted and they can be uh, reversed. They can be changed very easily if they're not institutionalized, if there are no strong lo laws that establish uh, migrants' access to them, but also if there are no uh, mechanisms for migrants for raising their con concerns and their um, their opinions on things. And I think uh, Salome touched upon a very important point, which is, which is that it starts with small things. It doesn't have to be migrants making an input into integration of migrants, you know. So it can be really day-to-day -day things that uh, where we really need these safeguarding mechanisms. And it's also actually the way forward with a lot of the more active citizenship, political participatory, non-electoral political participatory models where we look at the local level. And here, for instance, in the state of Baden-Württemberg in Germany, we find great examples where the state supports events networking of migrant-led organizations in cooperation with municipal actors, here creating a space where uh, those voices can be heard, right? There can be a communication support projects for migrant-led organizations to be engaged in development initiatives, not just regarding migrants, right? In local integration initiatives as well. One last thing I want to mention, uh, which is also an area where, despite the goodwill, we don't see a lot of action, is political parties. Salome also mentioned this. Uh, in a lot of cases, political parties are quite reluctant in changing the ways they operate. And which is part of the reason for the lower turnout rates recently, as well as uh, these alternative methods of citizen action that we are looking into. Uh, but that is not to say that political parties should just stick to their old guns. Uh, I think it's very important for them to seize this uh, wind of change and uh, also incorporate uh, more inclusive uh, methods of decision making and uh, currently we do not see many political parties incorporating different groups in decision making. Absolutely. You touched upon so many things we have said on this podcast in the previous episodes over and over again, like migrant participation needs to be tangible. It needs to happen on all levels. It should not only be on migration-related issues. My migrants should have a say, should be able to have a say in everything that happens in the society. And electoral politics is only one way of doing that. There are many other ways of participating in politics and civic life that are even more inspirational and can give you hope and bring you together with other people who share the same concerns. So I'm curious, and this is for, for both of you, are there any moments where you used your right to participate in civic and political life and it, it gave you hope and even more drive to keep doing what you're doing? Salome, so, maybe you can, you can go first. There are many ones. You know, I've been to the Irish Parliament where I presented to the, 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 the policymakers on many issues. There's one that I made, for example, at the very early days of the organization, and this was the one on the, you know, deportation of parent of Irish citizen, where the law was to change, you know, what is in the constitution was to change that anyone born in Ireland can become an Irish citizen. So it was to be changed. 
and so I gave a presentation in the Doyle. So I participated in that with other groups, but uh, I was giving a perspective of women and women as the primarily sometimes carers of their families and the one who have to take the burden of either leaving their children behind in a country where they want the best for their children and then they leave themselves because they wouldn't have the status or they would have to be deported because they are not citizens at that time. And I was very, very happy, you know, to be in the parliament for the first time in my life to present to the members of parliament, you know, at the Irish parliament, and which made a difference because even though the voting went the other way, so we had majority 80% of uh, agreeing that the automatic right to citizenship should be scrapped. The minister at the time still agreed to give the women and the people who had applied the 17,000 the opportunity to apply to be allowed to live in the country and they would not be deported. And this happened. So for me, uh, seeing that happening uh, and being involved in that process, and still my statement is read every time. It's quite often in our website uh, and elsewhere and referring to that and seeing that now those people at the moment as we speak in 2023, they are citizens, they are citizens of this country and they are contributing positively. Uh, for me, it has been a very, very rewarding experience. So that's a very joyful moment for me. And also uh, still continuing to see the changes that are happening in Ireland. You know, Basek mentioned about the, the strategies that we have. But I, I also think we need to work more to translate the realities of those policies, you know, when they are put together. Because the government may have the goodwill and the policymakers may have the goodwill. But to translate all this, what we put into paper, into actions, is the most important Yes, yes, absolutely. And and that's why representation matters, right? Salome, having you there at the parliament reading out that statement, which is still being used today, that's why we need actual, real, meaningful representation in places like the parliament. What about you, Bashak? Well, even though I've had uh, many opportunities to reflect on uh, research findings on integration of migrants and migration flows or reflect on the policy of the European Union on uh, migration at uh, various events and uh, directly addressing the parliamentarians at the European Parliament. The two events that I felt very special in, in, and engaged in political participation were not these uh, standard, more conventional ways, but they were actually re- not related to again, political participation or integration of migrants, but they were related to uh, climate action and climate activism. And again, I've followed many COPs and events and I made field visits, but still it was more non-conventional modes, joining the climate marches in Brussels with my entire family, with our uh, little baby uh, included and uh, meeting all the different people and chanting uh, in some languages we didn't even understand, but we were united in the same goal. So we more or less got the point and getting together with all those different groups, different nationalities of people who are all, you know, looking for ways to improve things uh, related to our planet concerning everyone. And the other one was uh, also citizen participation model through games, uh, also this year as part of a project called Level Up. And through games and activities, we discussed climate targets for 2040, and we focused on transport, food and waste management, participatory and oversight mechanisms, uh, with the participation of many uh, policymakers uh, from the European Commission. And, uh, but it was also many activists, researchers, and it was more than a networking, learning and brainstorming opportunity. We also came up with specific uh, proposals and targets for and how we wanted uh, to create better EU public consultation processes uh, on its 2040 targets. And uh, that's why maybe part of the reason why I answered the previous question with this uh, solution is that they were quite engaging and one feels so much more excited than classical conventional forms of participation when uh, you can be part of also more innovative modes of participation. Yes, I can certainly relate to that as a fan of non-electoral political participation. Those kinds of practices, especially protests, are the things that usually give me hope. 
like you said, Salome, they might not always succeed in that they might not lead to the decisions you wanted to be taken, but at least the fact that you see that other people share your concerns already helps a lot and it can make you feel less isolated in these political battles as well. I think that's a powerful, powerful note to end on. Thank you both so much for coming onto the podcast and sharing your knowledge and experience with us. Thank you, Seda. Thank you. Thank you so much. That was my interview with Dr. Salome Mugwa and Dr. Bashak Yacha. With the European elections just a few months away, the importance of innovative approaches, civic engagement, and a commitment to creating a political landscape that is truly representative and inclusive for all is crystal clear. So how do we get there? We need true representation and participation. New Europeans' political and civic participation needs to be more than theoretical. It needs to transcend mere migration-related matters and go beyond conventional electoral politics. To remake our table into one where everyone has a say, right here on this podcast, I will continue to talk to community leaders, researchers, and policymakers about how we can remove barriers and make European democracy inclusive and fit for an increasingly diverse and internationally mobile society. This podcast is produced by the New Europeans Initiative, a project of the Migration Policy Group, an independent Brussels-based think-and-do tank that sets the agenda on integration, migration, and anti-discrimination. Funding for the podcast is provided by the Citizens Equality Rights and Values Program of the European Union. If you like this episode, please subscribe and spread the word. Changing the Table is available on all podcast platforms. If you want to stay updated, follow the Migration Policy Group on social media at MIGPOL Group and subscribe to the newsletter at www.migpolgroup.com. Thank you. See you very soon.